Um, our first speaker today is Josh Cousins. Um, I call him the tall boss of Mar Cousins Merino Services, but Michelle informs me he's actually a director. Um, Josh has worked for Cousins Merino Services for five years, following the completion of his Bachelor of Ag from the University of Adelaide. Josh specialises in sheep classing, preg scanning and livestock consultancy. Over to you, Josh. Thanks for the bit of introduction, Jody. So, yeah, so we're based out of Burra in the mid-north of South Australia, so not too far down the road. Um, yeah, servicing Prill, most of South Australia. Uh, predominantly pregnancy scanning, sheep classing, wool testing, um, and yeah, assisting producers with individual animal management and uh, yeah, for you, helping them out with new technologies and that sort of thing. So today I'm gonna mostly talk about um, electronic identification as yeah, it's probably gonna come in mandatory, so you're gonna have the tags in the ear. Doesn't mean you have to use them, but I hopefully I can uh, yeah, give a few ideas and a bit of a brief overview to make you think about what you actually can do with those tags. So the key thing to really think about is how can we actually be more profitable on farm? So we can either increase production, increase the actual value of our product, or we can increase efficiency or decrease labour. So unless we actually think about those things and measure them, you're not really going to be able to increase anything on farm. So having electronic tags might not actually increase any of those things, but it might make you think about what you can do on farm and how you can actually increase or decrease that labour. So what actually is EID? Does anyone want to help me out? It's a pretty easy one to start off with, so if we can't get this one, we might be in a bit of strife. <laughs> anyone? There we go. It's pretty easy. It's just electronic identification. It's nothing too complex about it. Same with what is an electronic tag. Does anyone want to help me with that one? Once again, it's still a pretty complicated one. So all it is is a tag with an electronic chip in it. Nothing more to it. It's just yeah, a tag with an electronic chip, which allows us to actually read that, uh, read that identification number. So every chip's got a unique ID code, which rather than calling you, going out and naming every single sheep and remembering the name, you have a unique number, which you can just use a stick reader or a panel reader, read that tag, and it's easy, it's done. So unless you're really good with names or you've, uh, yeah, you like mucking around with a sheep's head and counting the number, um, yeah, electronic identification is a really easy way to go. So why would we want to actually use it? So it's a technology that actually facilitates individual animal management. So, like I said, it's not a big thing that's going to let you do everything. It just lets you read that individual animal and manage it specifically. So, through that, we can get improved data accuracy. Because I'm not sure about you, if you're reading tags, there's numbers going everywhere. You've got 653, 258, pretty easy to cross a few over. Um, I know I've done it manually quite a few times, and you get the data afterwards, and there. there's quite a lot of duplicates. So, yeah, definitely increases your data accuracy. Same thing, eliminates tag reading errors. You got that improved stock handling. There's less stress on you and the animal. Like I said, especially if you've got a stud and you're trying to, or you're breeding animals and you're trying to read that tag, you're mucking around with the sheep. It's more stress on you and it's more stress on the sheep. If you can just read that tag, it's done. You're ready to look at the sheep and actually do what you're trying to do. And reduction in time taken to collect data. So quite often that is a restriction on collecting data because it's a fair effort to do it. You just don't do it. There's no point doing it because it's just too hard. So like I said, all it really does is just help you um, yeah, increase your individual animal management and make you think about it a bit more. So does anyone want to help me out why you'd want to actually look at an individual animal rather than your flock-based approach? Well, you move away from that flock base because if we just look at a whole flock, you've got a massive variation within that flock. So if we can exploit, exploit that variation within the flock, we can look at your main profit drivers, which could be wool, meat, or your reproduction. So you can look at these dorpers, you can look at those lambs. If we can find out those ewes that are producing the most lambs, you're going to be able to help um, keep them longer and be able to be more profitable on farm. Same thing with your wool. You might want to look for a sheep that's got more wool or it could be one with less wrinkles so you can actually get shearers that will come and actually shear your sheep. Same thing with cattle. If, you're, um, yeah, if you can select those cattle that are producing you the most, uh, most calves, 
and the most meat, well, they're the ones you want to keep on farm. But if we just run them as a mob, keep them all night, we don't measure it, you don't know which ones are your more profitable animals. So, yeah, if you can keep those high-performing animals longer or actually select them, you're going to be a lot better off in the future. And those, like I was saying, you've got those better-performing ones, but also being able to identify those ones that may not have had a calf, may not, they might have only had one or two lambs, or they're cutting you bugger or wool. If we, we can take them out of the, identify them and take them out of the system, well, you can imagine you're going to be able to have a much better um, production system. So what have you, is everyone mostly sheep, cattle, merinos, dorpers? What have we got in the room? Can we get a hands up who's cattle producers? Or dorpers. dorpers. Yep. Hands up who's cattle producers in here? A few. What about merinos? Yep, mostly merinos. What about dorpers? So there's still a few, yeah, a few in here, but yeah, it's a good mixture. So yeah, today's probably mostly on sheep, but yeah, we do touch. A lot of it's all relevant for cattle as well as it's just producing meat, basically. Same with that. So, yeah, that's what you're trying to select on. So, like I was saying, within that flock, you could have these ewes that are walking around with a bucket on their head. They're not really doing anything. All they're doing is just eating the same feed as everything else, and they're still going around in your paddock. You're keeping them all the way through, culling them at five years old, six years old, and they're all going off together. You got a little fella over the right hand side. He's been studying his whole life, producing you more wool, producing you more lambs. Why are we getting rid of him when we can keep get rid of this one instead? So if we keep those superior animals longer, take out the ones that aren't going to make us any money, and then yeah, you can see how that sort of system's going to work. So if you look at it in more of like a bell curve, you've got that average in the middle. You get your poor performers and your better performers. If we take out those poorer performers that average is going to shift across and you're going to have a much better average over your whole flock. So another picture is like this one here. So we've got a whole flock of ewes. This girl here, she's got twins. That one hasn't even got a lamb. That one's got a single. Unless we actually identify those individual animals, we're going to run them all together. Say we've got 90% lambs out of them, job done. But if we can identify this ewe here, she's not cutting any wool, she hasn't got any lambs, well, what's the point of keeping her on farm? Whereas this girl here, she could be cutting us plenty of wool. She's got two nice lambs hanging off her. Let's keep her for a bit longer. Same with this one here. Unless we actually identify them, they're all just ran together. So a lot of this electronic tags isn't going to change it, but it just allows us to be able to record it and manage those animals a bit easier. So for... For identifying the number of lambs or um, number of calves, the easiest way is through pregnancy scanning. It's the cheapest method of doing so. Um, mothering up is the best way to do it, but it's not really applicable. So, yeah, unless you're a stud and you really want to get in the nitty-gritty of it, it's, uh, yeah, not a real cost-effective way to find out the number of lambs on farm. So if you can just get a pregnancy status, so as you can see here, we've got three years of pregnancy status. Um, Quite a lot as maidens didn't actually get rear a lamb. As a second, they've a lot more in lamb. But over the three-year period, you can see it ranges from zero to seven. So yeah, these one, this year here's had two, four, six. This one here's only had one. So if we've got those three years of pregnancy status, we can look back at the data and yeah, calculate how many lambs they've had. And we might put a draft column in and take out anything that's only had two lambs over those three years. But if we just ran them as a mob, like I said, you've just got 90% lambs. Oh, how come that mob was a little bit less than the others? But, yeah, if we look at it a bit more and actually think about it, you can measure it and, yeah, you can uh, move forward with it. How many people here pregnancy scan? A few? Yep. So what do you do with the dryers? Do you keep them or remate them? Or... Does anyone? Go on, you put your hand up. Uh, that dryers get thrown out. Yep. Yep. Rather than that dry yep. Yep. So yeah, like I said, with an electronic tag, you'll be able to take out those dryers that have been twice dry culled. But saying that, it is just as easy. Sometimes you can put a tag or a notch in the ear of those dryers, or if they're dry as an adult, you can get rid of them. Sometimes you can overcomplicate it with thinking EID is going to help you out. 
but it's just, like I said, gives you an easier record over overall management. Um, another way you can think of it, so this is a variation within a merino flock. Um, the information is pretty old, so it's 2006, um, but obviously you can probably double the, uh, the values of it all, but the actual um, weights are the same, which is actually probably a good example of why you shouldn't really select for a dollar value or a, um, the actual market value as that fluctuates. If you actually select for a fleece weight or a um, growth rate, that way that's not actually going to fluctuate within um, with the prices. So you can actually get a more idea and a more, um, more direct aim of where you're going and you'll actually get further in the future. If you have a direct target, you'll be able to get there. Whereas if you're trying to chase the market, you're going to change your decision making every year and you might not actually get anywhere. But as you can see here, your top 25% were cutting 5.3 kilos. The bottom was 3.9. The fibre diameter was 18.9. The highest was 21.9. As you know, with your markets, you get paid per kilo, but then the fibre diameter has a fair bit of difference in the market. So if we can select those ones that are producing more fleece weight with a finer fibre diameter, you're going to be able to go a lot further. Same with, you can calculate growth rates a lot easier. So manually weighing is always a bit of a pain in the bum. But if you've got an auto weigh system, as you can see, Prattley has got one here today, and I think Gallagher were coming as well, but I haven't seen them here. Um, yeah, if you can run through there and it's an easy operation to weigh your lambs, you can actually uh, use that information and yeah, make management decisions from that. But like I said, it, EID just makes it a lot easier to get this data and actually think about it a little bit more. Um, <coughs> So like I was saying, you could even look at reproduction. So you can look at your lambs weaned per you joined. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, you can put a dollar value on it, which is always sometimes good just to try and give yourself a bit of a um, understanding of where you're going. But it's you're much better off trying to select for your actual measurements. But yeah, as you can see, your fleece, uh, fleece value per you, the top 25% were cutting were a total value of $82 and the bottom were $37, which you will have that variation within your flock, but unless we identify those ewes, you're not going to know. Oop, same with the carcass. Some of them had a carcass value of 56, and some as a 12. You'd know that when you draft out your lambs, you've got those top-performing ones, and you've got those lower-performing ones. If you can select the, ones that are, yeah, select the ones that are actually getting you better lambs or better calves, you're going to be able to yeah, move that uh, genetic gain forward. So as I was saying with your fleece weight, so if you measure this, we have the fleece weight on the side, which is expressed as a percentage. So 100% is just the average of the flock. The fibre diameter, which that is the average. So let's just say that's 20 micron in the middle. So this would be 19, 18, 17, and obviously going further forward. If we can select those ewes that are actually have a finer diameter and still cutting plenty of wool, You'd imagine the fleece value of these ones going to be a lot more than this one over here that could be 23 micron and actually cutting 30% below some of these other ones. But that's the sort of variation that you actually have in a flock. But as I said, unless you're measuring it, they're just ran together and you don't have any idea. So being able to utilise this uh, information in the partial zone, Obviously, it is a lot harder because you are a lot more extensive and you're not actually bringing your ewes in as often. doesn't mean that you can't actually use it. So you can utilise this information to help yourself benchmark. So how many of you benchmark yourselves with genetics, feeding supplements or anything like that? Does anyone measure any new supplements or any feeding that you can do or not? Does anyone use any supplements? So it is always hard to try and figure out whether they are actually going to work or not. But I think that is a massive room in the pasture zone to be able to benchmark yourself on different genetics because quite often you just go to the same stud or do the same thing. If you can benchmark yourself and test out some new genetics and see what's actually going to do in your area, unless you're measuring it, you're not really going to know and you'll stick to the same thing. But you could be making massive production gains just from changing something else. Feeding is a really hard part. But if even just supplementing some minerals or some nutrients, whether it works or not, if you haven't tried it, how are you going to know? But if you actually utilise the information and test yourself and actually try it, you might find out there's some production gains that you can just get by feeding a few supplements 
few mineral licks or something like that. Keeping it easy because obviously you are in a pastoral zone. You can't go out and trail feed every single one of your ewes. But being able to think about it a bit more, benchmark yourself and test out a few, um, yeah, few different things, you might be able to make that step forward. Um, yeah, you can look at more key profit drivers or you can yeah, do your own research, do your own type of studies. Or a few people are doing a bit of work with Adelaide Uni. So there's always different possibilities out there. And if you actually utilise the um, electronic identification, it makes it a lot easier. So other uses. So using your tags, you can actually record your treatment and management rec records. So any vaccine, drench, backline or parasite history. You might have only done it to one mob. You can put it in as a um, you've had that treatment on them. And then if it comes back later on, oh, hang on, these users are in a lot better condition, you can go back on your record and actually see those individual animals have actually had that type of treatment. Because um, how many people actually use vaccines and drench their use? Too many people here at all or not? Yeah. But it's the same thing. It's A lot of pastoralists probably don't really use it. Um, but unless you're actually measuring it, how do you know if it actually works? The sale reps are always going to tell you it's going to help you out. But unless you actually measure it on farm, how do you know if it's actually helping you out or not? Um, like I said, you can record the pregnancy status a lot easier. Um, without electronic identification, you can just bang a tag in the twins or mark the twins or that sort of thing. But if you've got it on the electronic tag, you can run them through an auto drafter later on. So you can yeah, use that pregnancy status either to go on a entire lifetime record so you can split off those ones that have had two, three, four lambs over their lifetime, or you could box and scan them, box them back together, and before lambing, you could split them off and manage them separately. Um, or you could do it for sale as well. So I think that will probably be something that will come in later on once it all gets better. So rather than just saying, oh, radio, these ewes are scanned in lamb, there's an actual record of these exact um, ear-tagged ewes are scanned in lamb. Um, so the other thing is just really looking at your performance data. So you look at your wool production, meat production. Um, with the electronic tags, you think all those new uh, all those new abattoirs and that sort of thing, they've all got um, reading systems in it. You don't think some of those new that new TFI lot's going to have this all in there? That's got it all in there, ready to go, and it's actually a lot easier than what you think. That carcass will come in. They'll scan the tag. It will have a barcode. The barcode will just be stuck to the carcass. That carcass will go down the line. Everywhere down the line where it's cut up, that tag will just go along with it. It will go to the supermarket. You just have a QR code there. So you'll be able to read that QR code and it will be able to come straight back to your farm. Without electronic identification, no one's writing down the tag number and that sort of thing. It just happens all autonomously and just happens down the line. But without electronic tags, you just can't do that. From that, you also get more meat-eating quality and you'll get intramuscular fat and other information back from the uh, abattoirs. So whether you want to use this information or not, you don't have to, but this is the sort of thing that you will get information back from by having these tags in them. Um, yeah, like I said, reproduction. The other thing that is really good for, so when classing use, you can, um, it's good to go have a look at Gallagher or True Test today or Shearwell. Um, you can just go along and class, put any classing grades, any visual grades in there. It's basically like having a phone, read the tag, you can put any information in there at all. That is quite powerful, but at the same time, you can be stuffing around in the yards and not actually get anywhere. Make sure you've got a clear goal and you actually want to get somewhere with it, but you can record so much information really easily. So how many people class their ewes and class their cattle and that? Yep. What do you sort of select on? Do you store it all visually or? Yep. So visually is a really good way to go about it. And But if you can record some information on there, you can go visually or you can add any visual traits. So you might want to select on breech wrinkle, some with a bit less wrinkle, or you might want to select for bearer head covers, or you might want to select on um, structural grades. So you might be able to go along and just give them a, stru stu uh, a structural grade of one to five go along and easily do it. Without electronic tags, it's just hard work. Someone's with a notepad reading along, doesn't work. But yeah, go have a play around with some of the sites that are here. They'll show you the stick readers and stuff they've got. It is really easy to record data. So yeah, like I said, you can. Yeah, it's up to your imagination what you want to use with it. 
But yeah, it does make recording data really easily. Um, the other thing is auto drafts. So they are the next level up. They aren't cheap, but I think they can be really good use in the partial zone because it can decrease your labor. So you can box mobs back together and then at shearing or crutching time. So you could either have, um, yeah, have any treatments you've done to them, any pregnancy status or even your culls and everything all together. After shearing, you can just run them back through the auto drafter and separate them in whatever way you want. Same thing, you could put it to um, paddock allocation too. So if you've got a, obviously probably a fairly extensive property, you can box mobs together. If you've put the, which paddock you put them to to start with, box them back together as you're bringing them in for shearing, crutching or whatever you're doing in the yards, box them together, bring them all back in a mob. You're gonna save a bit of labor because you're not going back out bringing them in individually. Box them all together, shear them, treat them, whatever you need to do, and then just run them through the auto drafter and then take them back out to the paddock they were originally at. So this is the sort of things you can do. Like I said, it's up to your imagination what you want to do and what you're going to get on farm is going to be up to you. Um, but yeah, it's just yeah, whatever you want to do with it, but they are really useful tools. Um, so yeah, a few key points. Uh, yeah, it just allows us to record lots of data and information easy. There's no point recording all this data if you're not going to use it. Like I said, you can spend hours in the yards trying to record data, but if you don't actually have a clear goal or what you want to do with it, you're just going to waste yourself some time and you're better off just doing a few other things on farm. You're better off looking at the main profit drivers, so whether that's saving yourself some time or decreasing labour or increasing the value of your products. The other thing is it's not really a matter of where, uh, if it will happen, it's when the next drought will come, you're going to have to destock some use. So if you have those key, uh, those key animals that are producing you more value on farm, if you can select those ones that aren't actually uh, performing on your farm, you're going to be much better off when you're restocking. Same with if you can keep those ewes five, six, seven, eight years old that are those, uh, those really productive ewes on farm, you're going to be way better off when you're restocking. But that's probably yeah, the main, main thing in the partial zone is just destocking and restocking, being able to identify those more profitable ewes and yeah, going with that. But like I said, EID is the top of the pyramid. You're a lot better off getting your management sorted and your nutrition. So EID is great, but you're probably going to be a lot better off and get a lot further changing uh, to making sure you're up to date with your best management and nutrition and keeping you in good order. Obviously, it's hard when it doesn't rain. That's yeah, rain is the main yeah main thing. But if you can try and think about how you can help you use, because nutrition is the main driver of fertility and everything on farm, if you can try and keep you using better Nick, it will certainly be a lot better off. But as EID is right at the top, you might be better off just getting yourself some new yards. Because we go around to a lot of different places around the place, I can guarantee you everyone that's got better yards, spent a bit of money on yards and infrastructure around the place, they are a lot happier. You could save yourself two or three hours every time you use yards, Save yourself a couple hundred bucks a year on work shirts and you've got a happy bloody, yeah, happy work environment. They don't have to be too expensive. So these are proway yards. They are quite expensive, but they are really good. These are semi-portable yards. You can get a set of portable yards like that for 10, 15 grand. It's amazing how cheap they really can be. But yeah, like I said, you're probably a lot better off spending a bit of um, money on farm and getting your practice, yeah, your management and your nutrition right before you try and go right into EID. Just because they've got tags in their ear doesn't mean you need to do anything with it. You can just keep and run them exactly the same as you have been. But, yeah. We've got time for some questions. Bart's going to come and grab the microphone somewhere. Yep. Questions for Josh? I'll get you started. Josh, um, where do you suggest um, a producer in the pastoral zone might start if they want to do some individual animal management? Yep. So, like I said, you're better off starting sitting down around the table and actually making a plan of where you want to go with it. Um, you can always try and go out in the yards and try and do it out in the yards, but unless you actually have a um, yeah a direct aim and sight of where you want to go with the information, you're better off just having an actual plan. Sit down, work it out. Spending one or two hours in the office might save you five or six in the yards and a lot of arguments. So. Yeah, so whether that's sitting down with yourself or finding someone else that can sit down with you and try and work out a plan, it's just, yeah, try to work out a plan and a bit of a guide of where you want to go with it. 
Mary Lou Bishop, Kwandong yep. Station, your part of the world. Yeah. Um, a question regarding lambs in the pastoral area. At what's if we put in the EID tags, which we will, at what stage or how do you test the ewes to know that they're carrying one or they have had one or two lambs? I'm just curious as to what stage you bring them back through and how you know that they how many lambs they've had. Yep. So, like I said, pregnancy status is the easiest way to do it. So, just as you're scanning them, you can either, um, yeah. So, as a scanner, I just have my scanning crate. I have a scale head with a panel reader hooked up to it. As the U comes into the crate, I'll scan the U. Select like a, pregnancy. Yeah. So, halfway through, like pregnancy, you'll be able to detect if they're a single twin or a dry. So, the U's come in. This panel reader will read the tag. We go to the scale head and I'll just select how many lambs are inside the U. That'll record it next to her name, or next to her identification. They'll all go through and then, yeah, you can either bring that up whenever you want. You can do that on the dot or three or four years down the track when you've got three or four years of data. But, yeah, you do it as you're going or you split them off as you're scanning. So you can draft them singles, twins, dries, split them all off into the direction and then run them back through afterwards and record them that way, so through your auto drafter or power reader or stick reader, if that makes sense. It does, yep. but it means we'd have to muster. And yep. has any viability been done on the um, cost effectiveness of bringing them in during the pregnancy or just letting them rip? Because it costs yeah. to muster in our area a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that is the... Uh, limitation in the pastoral zone. So we um, we scan up at Mount Eber, so that's where partners in a property um, just north of Glendambo. So we pregnancy scan there, but we bring them in all at shearing time halfway through um, gestation. So then we can scan them all at shearing as they're coming through. Uh, it works well for us, but yeah, same thing. It's yeah, it, been able to muster everything in just for scanning. It's probably not really that viable for us. But if you can try and work out a system where let's just say you have three or four different sets of yards that are centrally located and you can bring three or four mobs in at once, well, you, yeah, you've got to try and work out on farm whether you can actually muster those paddocks in and make it viable. Um, each system is going to be different. As a lot of you would imagine, every different pastoral place has its own limitations and its own restrictions. So what's going to work at one place might not work at another. So one place might be able to bring a few into the yards, but sometimes it might be mustering in some of the hills and that it's just not worth bringing them in. But, yeah, you've just got to try and work out, maybe work out a system that can work for you or, yeah, it's just trying to work it out if it's going to work for you, I suppose. Yeah. I might just add to that the other way um, is to start with one mob, like do, you know, with part of your property um, and do it for those and then look at the cost effectiveness for that mob base and then, you know, then you can make a decision whether you extend that to the rest of the property or not. But sort of having that one experimental mob where you're preg scanning um, might be an option. You obviously don't have to scan. If you're just at landmarking time, just wet dry your use and just, yeah. Obviously, if you've got electronic tags, it's pretty easy to just go, oh, righty, that you doesn't have an udder on it or that uh, cow hasn't got an udder on it. Scan her in as a dryer and then just record it that way. That's You won't be able to get your singles and twins that way, but that's still recording your dries. So does anyone wet dry at landmarking and check udders or not? Few, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, like I said, that's an easy way. You can just use a, use a wand. Oh, hang on, that you doesn't have an udder. Beep, put a rattle on her or whatever you want to do. But, yeah, that's probably the most simple and cost-effective way of doing it. Um. I might ask one more, Josh, which is a question I often get, is bucket files. And people often look for the bucket that comes with their tags. Do you want to explain a bit about bucket files? Yep. So, yeah. So, with your electronic tags, you'll get a bucket file. So, with the electronic tag, you'll get a unique identification code, which is about nine digits, is it? How many? 16. 16 digits. So, yeah, you're not going to write that on the tag. So, you'll get a visual visual um, number on the tag as you would any other tag. Um, so that could be yeah, one to a thousand or whatever it is. But then you also have that unique 16-digit um, code allocated to the tag. So a bucket file is just a normal file, like an Excel file, 
that'll just have all the visual numbers on those tags align with the unique 16 digit identification code on that tag. So basically that just lines it up. So then you could be out in the paddock and go, oh, right, yeah, this U is number 56, write it down, and then you can put it into the file later on. So yeah, it is still utilizing data, but yeah, that is sort of what it is. Um, yeah, matches up the visual to the EID. Um, the other thing I did was going to say with um, auto drafting, you can also do it with your wool clip. So if you are measuring those traits of your U, so let's just say you did get a micron test for your hoggets or a fleece weight for your hoggets. So with your micron test, you could have that as a lifetime record for that U. It's probably going to stay pretty stable over a lifetime. So like I said, you had that variation with the flock coming into um, where you could either put a tag in there as, let's just say, a coloured tag and have your finer microns, medium microns, higher microns, and then draft them off manually. But if you have an auto draft it, as they're coming into shearing, you can draft them two, three ways and then have a more uniform uh, clip. So, yeah, if that makes sense. So, yeah, that way you've got that measurement over a lifetime. As you're coming into shearing, you can have your finer micron U's all getting shorn together, all getting bailed together and sent off for a more uniform clip. So with the deviation with the price, yeah, obviously sometimes it'd be more profitable than others, but that is something that you can do with, um, yeah, with electronic tags. Yeah, to chase those micron premiums. Yeah. Would you join me in thanking Josh for his presentation?